time my um, um, uh, the, I mean, the past, I guess, three, three lectures, where I've been uh, trying to uh, uh, give you know, like more explanation about our holy Bible. Still, I'm doing. And uh, so like you said, you know, um, the, the, the inspiration came from this high school uh, student, you know, my mentor, and his question like, oh, who, 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 no. who are those people who mentioned, and what are those signs mean? So I said, oh, okay, cool. Then maybe uh, uh, I'll do my best to give more details on those uh, uh, holy names and gods and goddesses and signs and symbols of our holy family seal. Okay. So with that, is this is going to be a part two of uh, the, uh, the previous uh, um, uh, uh, explanation we did. Which so was part three? Of a, is it part three? Yeah, I mean the, the second part of uh, last week, which is okay. Kim and Omen. Okay. We were still uh, covering uh, uh, our noble ancestor Kim and uh, the name Omen is all found in the, uh, in the sea. Okay. So, With that in mind, I'll just want to go ahead and go. Uh, uh, I'm going to continue with Kim. This is the history of Kim, and I was given this lecture uh, by our high, uh, uh, high shape. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm grateful for this one, and I'm going to share that with you, okay? The history of Kim. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> domestication. So, so we covered about the last in the in the previous uh, 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 lecture. I covered about how it was Kim that started the systematic domestications of animals. So this lecture uh, by our uh, adept High Sheikh Wabra will give you more like more enlightenment about the accomplishment of our noble ancestor Kim. Okay. So continue. History of Kim. Domestication of animals and bees and cultivation of the vine, invention of the whip, the sharpest crop, and the uh, syrinx. The Kemites now began to domesticate animals and to use them for food. The first animal domesticated was the goat. At this point, a fourth great man appeared. His name was Kim. He lived at Apu, county seat of the nine known of Upper Egypt. His native known was afterwards named Kim in his honor, and Apu was called Panopolis by the Greeks. And, and you can look back. The previous lecture I did about Pan, you know, Pan and Panopolis and how the Greeks pictured them and stuff in the previous lecture. He was the first goat herder. And while it is probable that an occasional pet had been raised. So when I read that, you know, who came in my mind? The movie Coming to America. In that movie. <laughs> And that movie, you know, where Eddie Murphy was talking to the lady, you know, he, yeah, she asked him, like, what do you do? You know, you, you're like, I'm a goat hunter. <laughs> she was like, really? I'm like, yeah, I'm like, uh, and that, that, that movie. But I said, ah, oh, interesting, you know. He, he, he gave her that unique, you know, like, I'm a goat, you know, herder, you know. But Kim, in a way then, he is Kim, see. <laughs> he was the first goat herder. And one, it is probable that an occasional pet had been raised. Kim was the first man to go into the business of systematically raising domestic animals as an occupation. Okay. The goat was milked and use of butter and cheese introduced as additional varieties of food. Okay. Very soon afterwards, the sheep Dog, hog, ox, and ass were domesticated. Also chickens, ducks, geese, pigeons, uh, guineas, and peafowls. 
the ancient, their ancient pictures, our ancestors, our noble ancestors' pictures, show that they also domesticated the antelope, gazelle, hunting cat, quail, stork, and falcon. I thought that was very enlightening, the falcon. You see them when you strike your hand, the falcon will come and land on, you know, wow! <laughs> and our ancestor came up with that idea. The domestication of animals seems to have proceeded with great rapidity when, when one started. For Cam was, li was, for Cam was living, Hathor appears, and she afterwards invented the club which was yoked to milk cows and later yeah. to oxen. Now, this sentence right here is, is very, very enlightening, I thought, you know. Hathor, um, we, will, uh, uh, we will cover when we cover, uh, uh, we will come back to her when we do Isis and Hathor together. Mm -hmm. But this invention, let me tell you funny. I went to, uh, uh, my son, Malik, I was, one of the students who represented his school at uh, Washington University. Science Bowl, they call it the Science Bowl in high school, I mean elementary schools from different uh, know, uh, eighth graders and seventh graders, they compete for this, they call it the Science Bowl at Washington University. And Malika had a chance to, to be one of those five students selected, representing his school, and he went to that Science Bowl. Uh, and sadly, well, I guess we were the only Kemet up there. <laughs> you know? <laughs> lots of Indians, lots of Chinese, mm -hmm. and lots of Europeans. But me and Malachi was the only Kemet in a way, you know. Um, Ethiopians up there. But I was happy, you know. He, he, he represented the race and his school well. But, so at that time, this lady was there for, she's a PhD, uh, a guest of Monsanto. Uh, agriculture science, so she was the one to opening the ceremony you know, the, before the competition you know, uh, began. She gave a speech, she was a guest of honor, she got so many PhD, whatever, but so, and she represented the agriculture and science, you know, it's a science ball, so she, she, she's talking about that. So one thing she said, I said, wow, she was telling the, the audience, she said there's five things that, you know, in the history of agriculture, that's, that's like the biggest thing in the history of agriculture. And she named about the tractor, you know, which is good, and other, you know, discoveries of science or other. But, finally, what she said was the number one, the one, number one thing that changed the history of agriculture was the plow, you see. Mm. I said, that's us, right? <laughs> that is us. Mm -hmm. I wonder how many people understood. But she said, it was the plow. The invention of the plow was the biggest thing in the history of agriculture. Mm -hmm. I said, and that credit goes to Hathor. Mm -hmm. uh, because she came up with that idea. Mm -hmm. Like, if I put... You know, those ox, if I put some, something on top of them and put that V and mm -hmm. she invented Cultivate the ground. Mm -hmm. And cultivate the ground. And for 80,000, she said, 80,000 years we've been using the plow. Mm -hmm. 80,000 years. It just changed it not even 60 years ago when they invented the, you know, the, the tractor. You know? yeah, yeah. So for 80,000 years, it's been the plow. That sustained the human race. Okay. And it was us, it was at all that came up. So when, when I read this too, I was like, wow, I gotta share that with you. So for Kim, go back to the lecture now, for Kim was living, Hathor appears. And she afterwards invented the plow, mm -hmm. which was yoked to milk cows and later the oxen. The dog seems to have been domesticated at Sinopolis, which right now they call it al Quis in, in Egypt right now currently, but in the ancient time, it was a Hellenized name, that was the Greek name, the, the name of the city is called Sinopolis. Yes, the sheep at Tibis, the cat at Bubastis, and the cow in the
the vicinity of Onion Town, possibly at Atribis. Very powerful information. All right, that was it, you know, and our Fahami College was sharing with us. So it's just something to think about, like, huh? So when I read it, I'm like, the cow seems to have been domesticated at Cineapolis, the sheep at Tiris, the cat at Bupa. So now it makes sense when you see those animals, our ancestors, they are paying tribute to their, their ancestors who domesticated those animals. That's Another angle of looking at <coughs> When I read it, I was like, wow, that's another way of to look at what our ancestors chose those animals to represent. Mm -hmm. uh, the Anubis was a dog, hey. uh, Haru was a falcon. So, yeah, they are symbol of this, the spirituality, but at the same time, they were domesticated. Mm -hmm. It was Kim that domesticated those animals. So, I was enlightened for this one. <clears throat> yes. The use of domestic animals gave the Kemite an immense increase in their food supply. For though the flesh of wild animals was eaten, a steady supply of this cannot be depended upon in a thickly settled country. Okay. As Kem was the first herder, he was given credit for the idea of domesticating animals for food. That is king. That is something which we will claim and you know, we are going to uh, uh, claim it and that's it. <laughs> Some 2,000 years later, and, and like I said last week, uh, when I did the research, there's over 1.9 million uh, farms right now in the United States alone mm -hmm. who, who, who deal with pigs and cows and those things too. All of them goes to our to our noble ancestor Kim. Some two thousand years later, in the days of canoe called Hercules. So Hercules was uh, uh, was Hercules. They domesticated the horse and camel and used leopard for hunting. Mm -hmm. Two thousand years later. So the, the evolution still continues, you know. What our ancestors started is still going on right now. Mm -hmm. It's still humans are still domesticating animals. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> 3,000 3, years after Kim, the Aryans brought the elephant into use in India and the native buffalo, while the Scanner. Uh, Scandinavians, 5,000 years later, domesticated the reindeer. Interesting. Descendants of the Kemite, at the date unknown, domesticated in Peru the llama and the alpaca. Yes. So still, evolution is still going on. The domino is still going on. Kem had another claim to distinguish from the fact that he first introduced the cultivation of the grape. I covered this last in the last in my previous um, lecture, how uh, even Adam and Eve were, you know, they were thrown from Kim, so they don't enjoy the, the nectar of the gods, the grape juice was called the nectar of the gods. In fact, I just found out, uh, did some research on it, and uh, they just I mean, confirmed that the ancient Kemite was the one that were, they were drinking grapes for thousands and thousands. They thought it was something else, they were some red uh, juice or something, but now, it was a, they thought it was a red beer. No, it was a grape juice, our ancestors have. And they say, oh, so it, it, it goes even farther. So what our Fahami Khalid, the Holy Fahami Rara, so revealed for us was no point. He first introduced the cultivation of the grape. The vine grew wild in Egypt. But Cain began a systematic cultivation and kept the first vineyard. But this means the wild grape was improved into the cultivated variety. All the grapes we enjoy, the green one, the red one, the different... Those things were 
uh, uh, started with our noble ancestors. The wild grape is eaten by animals and birds. In ancient Egypt, the value of the wild grape was appreciated as an article of food. Cultivated grapes were used fresh and afterward dried as raisins. The freshly pressed juice was valued as a pleasant beverage and, uh, uh, and they even called it the nectar of the gods. In Greek, they say it was the nectar of the gods and I covered that more details on my previous um, lecture. So we're going to salute Kim, whose name is Min and Amun, the mighty. Rahmun of this al -Om. Ori, the seer, with his golden flame and golden sword, to stop the demon darkness. He is the Kom Om Go, our father, Fahmi Ra Rasul. The name of Kim, in whom strength and vigor and love and joy does vibrate and abound. Yes. The night of lights. All powerful yet serene, a witness to the majesty of God, and Kim is hung for Ami Ra Rasul. So, with that, I will conclude about Kim, and uh, we're going to go part two again, the second part of Amun, which is on, uh, the, sec I mean, the name Amun, uh, uh, and we, we're going to go. Two of them. The sign, I call this one the signs of Amen. The signs of Amen. But before I begin, <laughs> but we go to the signs of Amen, I would like to show a quick video which even inspired me to talk about this subject. This uh, 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 was uh, inspired and shared by Imam Baka in our Fahami Temple of Divine Understanding, our Facebook, um, um, and he shared um, this in, in, that, in our, uh, you know, the, the Facebook page, and after I listened to it, I said, ah, oh, you know what, I know what I'm going to talk about, so I'm going to give you a little bit, uh, 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 it's, it's about, you know, but we're not going to watch the whole thing, just uh, maybe uh, after two, three minutes old. So this brother, his name is Bobby Hammett, uh, um, like I said, he's been around since the 90s. In the, 20, the uh, 2000s, he is one of what you call the metaphysician. You know, he, 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 him, and selected few back in the days. They kept the the spiritual and the occult uh, hidden uh, knowledge of our ancestors' metaphysical truths. So let's listen to him, and he's gonna deep, he's gonna go deep into Haru and Set, uh, the light and the darkness. Okay, uh, and uh, listen to it. Then we're gonna go to what uh, uh, Christian representation of Christ. Hey, Ru Hart. Jesus, in this case, which is hard, said, Satan, get behind me. Face the stone and top the spine is the most concentrated part of melody. The Madula Ave God, the Bible of God. Satan, get behind me is melody. Sut on. Sut, which means the true of life. one from the 
temple of Komon go to the Hebrews later on, I sit at the tree of life, and this is the one from the temple of Tehuti, or the priesthood of Tehuti, is the same damn temple. The serpent say, don't eat this tree. The serpent say, go ahead, which means your cool need to eat it, your eyes up, and eat the apple, which is your third eye, called the Bindu seed. Up here, the tree of life, the serpent crawls up the tree of life, and they eat a part called the dog. Now, the Hebrews take this part off because the white Hebrews don't have dark. That means melody. So they take this point off, which means dark. D A A T H, a dat. Blackened in the stage, melody. That's where you get where dark Vader from. The dark side. Pure melody. Dark Vader was taken, was called in. Joseph Campbell was called in to help them work with Star Wars. And it's, it's adequate. The Jedi warrior. The jet black eye. Melody. The Jedi warrior. The jet pillar. You know what the jet pillar is in Kimmy? It's the backbone of Osiris. What's the backbone of Osiris? Bam! Backbone of Osiris. The Jedi warrior. The Jedi what? The black eye. The eye of the Hebrew. Dark Vader. Dark, right? The D-A-A-T-A. The black dot. You don't know the powers of the dark side. Everybody got the black man and do the voice. Then the hero, Luke Skywalker, rises up, conquers Dark Vader, who is his father, and becomes the Christ. Light coming out of darkness. The hero. Heru. The word hero comes from the word Heru, and the word hero is Greek for great face, face of God, pineal gland, mm. Lucifer, light bringer. <laughs> Seth, the goddess of the seven stars, is represented in Ursha Major in the, uh, in, the, in the heaven. The word Seth or Sut means black, but this god is also associated in a mentor, hidden god. A mentor is the deepest part of your subconscious, the hidden land. Hell is the hidden land inside your brain. That's where you are. You are the Lord of hell. In the Lovaskis see the doctrine, they say when the church curses Satan, they're only cursing the cosmic reflection of God. Alright, alright, alright. So with that, huh? we can you can go to our uh, uh, funny uh, Facebook page and you can see the rest of it. So after I watched it, I said, okay, okay. <laughs> good, good, good. And I said, I even said uh, uh, um, to uh, Imam Baka on the I said, he gave me some idea. So, uh, 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 um, very enlightening. But I said, what is our holy family had to say about it? In fact, I mean, of course, you know, this is in the 90s and stuff, but since 1919, our holy family, there are to be opponent, he was the one that gave us the signs of the darkness. Okay, so the sign I called it the signs of honor. So we will go ahead and uh, remember what he was talking about in the beginning was the darkness. So signs, our holy family Rarasu said in the beginning. The Most High God created space and darkness and then placed therein matter in the worlds and then created man so that man might know God. Hmm. You just have to stop right there. In the beginning, the Most High God in the Ali created space and darkness and then placed therein matter which is Anna, man, and the world is, and then created man so that man might know God. Out of every curse, there comes a blessing. And out of every blessing, there comes displeasure. The opposites, you know? Blessings, displeasure. Out of a curse, and there's a blessing, and out of blessing, there comes displeasure. So, only family telling us the opposites of things. And the learned man will ask you concerning the darkness, and the light, and time, and space. So, inform them by saying, the light is the spirit of Amen revealed, and the darkness the spirit of Amun conceals. Yet, Amun is never hidden mm. 
from those who understand, for their light penetrates the darkness. And there, from mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Time is a degree of light, and darkness a degree of eternity. Space is an ethereal substance filling every vacancy not occupied by dense matter. And before space was Amen, mm. he is the presence of all things. Cold, this is supreme science. Cold, agitated, produces heat. And heat is the result of activity or life. So the ever living must ever be active. Stillness is death. Action is life. And the most high Amun controls all things. Whether we preserve a body or let it be consumed by fire or bury it in the earth or dissolve it in water, the influence of its life lingers for a time, but the soul and its light returns to one. So, what I just read, what our brother was trying to explain, but he had no idea about this, right?
I said, okay. And uh, I have shared this uh, with our passion, and he loved it, and I love this book too. So in this, yes, we won the Zulu's uh, folklore about creation. This is a Zulu, his name is, I'm sorry, his name is uh, Gusama, uh, uh, Gusama Zulu Kritio Muto. He is a 97 year old, he's still living right now. 97. He is one of the, uh, what you, they call them uh, uh, Sangomas or perfected beings. Mm. He's a he, metaphysical, spiritual guide of the Zulu nation. And he's still living at 97 year old. So, and the follow-up of this book was written by a Fahani initiate. Her name was uh, uh, Tisha. Ima, I think you know her. In the 1970s, she was initiate of the Fahani Temple of Amun Ra here in St. Louis. She was the one that wrote the uh, 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 Lucia Tish. Louisa. Lu I'm sorry, yeah. Louisa, Louisa Tish. Tish. Yes. She was the one who wrote the foreword for this book. Yes, yes, yes. So, let's go to her. Uh, and, and she gives a little, like, hint. She said, at the end, she said, uh, I will do it as far as my wings can take me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing So, she knows that she, and she gave, you know, she, you know, in her interview, she said she was initiated at first by the Fahani Temple of uh, um, Amun Ra. Amun Ra in 1969 here in St. Louis. So, mm -hmm. let's go read, you know, something from, I mean, uh, from their uh, folk folklore. Mm -hmm. The Tree of Life. The Tree of Life. I mean, I know Fabi Hammond was talking about the Kabbalah, but this is coming from Busama Zulu, Kulo Mutwa, our elder and a uh, uh, wisdom keeper of the Zulu nation, okay? Chapter 2. And, uh, and just listen, and we'll talk about connecting to our Holy Fahami revelation in 1920s, 1919, in the beginning, the most high God created space and darkness, okay? In the beginning, nothing existed but the fertile darkness floating on the invisible river of time. There was no sun, there was no stars, nor the light of the moon, no earth, no place to stand, no vegetation, no waters, no roaring ocean, no brooks or rivers, no animals, no people. Nothing existed but nothingness mm. and a darkness that overspread all. Mm. But there was trouble, a stirring in the darkness, a desire arose in the river of time, a desire for something, mm. for the fertile darkness to give birth to something out of nothing. Mm. It was a strange meeting between time and nothing. But from it came one tiny spark of living fire. And the living fire was consciousness. It began to know things. And it knew it was alone in the darkness. And its loneliness was like that of every infant whose mother has been taken away. It was like a tiny firefly lost in the caverns of caverns beneath the earth. It was the first great loneliness. And all creatures since then shared a little in that loneliness. The one that emerges when consciousness sees itself alone in the vastness of everything. It is the part in us that cringes in the dark when the lions and the hyenas 
howl beyond the tiny village compound. It is the part in us that shivers when it sees the vast blackness between the stars. I am the spot world. I am. In its fury and loneliness, it fed upon the nothing and the fertile darkness. And so it began to grow. And it grew into a light, shining in the darkness. And then a great blaze. Nothingness felt this something and did not like it. For something negates nothing. And nothing wants only nothingness. <laughs> so when it felt a blazing angry presence in its midst that said, I am, it wished, it, it wished to destroy it. It gathered the coldness from the space between the stars and sent coal to overwhelm and destroy the spark of fire. And thus, it happens that when a child asserts itself too strongly, even a very loving parent may secretly wish to de destroy it, to quiet it down, and be quiet, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, this light was so, uh, 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 the darkness tried to quiet this, this light. The I am, he says, you know. But all living things resist whatever threatens its very life. Mm. So the spark grew brighter and fought against the cold and the darkness, which was its ancient mother. And the light broke and consumed the darkness, and the darkness the light. And still we see the blazing sparks in the cold black night sky as a reminder of that first struggle of becoming. And the river of time, father to the child, saw the child's battle with its mother, the fertile darkness, and join its cold eternity to the battle. Since that time, Father Time snaps every spark of consciousness that comes into being. But the fertile darkness secretly holds a mother's compassion, and so she bursts them again from the darkness of her soul. And so we see beings come into existence and wink out again, and the stars blaze in the sky, or die in a great explosion of fire, which is their scream of, I am. Okay. And since that time, there is also the internal battle of fire and ice, of light and of darkness throughout this universe. The wise ones, the, the families, <laughs> the wise ones know that if the fire were to triumph, all things would die in a universal roaring flame. But if the darkness and the cold were victorious, all things would grow cold and stiff and cease to be in that way. And so we balance forever between the fire and ice, light and dark, heat and cold. That can be and our Holy Fahami Rara so say, all religions are temperamental, hot and cold. All of them is between the two energies. All religions are hot and cold. It's, it's the fight between the cold and the heat. Six months of heat, now we got six months of cold. 
<laughs> we are about to go, you know, the fall and winter, you know. Six months of heat is internal battle between the hot and the cold. Now we, are, we just started the whole cycle. For the next six months, we go, we go in the cold. You know? <laughs> when the summer sun blazes in the sky, we seek for cool dark shadows and caves beneath the rocks. And when winter blasts the earth with its icy breath, we crunch by the fire or shiver to warm our flesh and long for the sun's warmth. And the wise ones, the Fahamis, know that this is a battle that must always be fought, but never won. Only the great spirit, Amun, may watch over such a titan, titanic struggle and remain calm. For the battle goes this way and that, and all life struggles in its embrace. As the flesh grows hot with fever and must be cooled, violent with the heat of passion and must be satisfied. May the spirit of life grant that this one great battle go on while all the lesser ones are given up. It is the great struggle on which all life depends. Okay. So with that, now we can go back to our holy family, Rasu. He said, cold agitated produces heat and heat is the result of activity or life so the ever living must ever be active mm -hmm. yes yeah, so now with that we can understand stillness is dead mm -hmm. that cold and that nothingness like the Zulu Shama was talking about is dead nothing so I am came out of it. that light came out of that darkness action is life mm -hmm. he said the Holy Father he said and the Most High Amen controls all things, the dark and the light, the heat and the cold under the control of Amen. And before space was, Amen is the presence of all things. Okay. Time is a degree of light and darkness a degree of eternity. Okay, so, uh, so I, I love my body, it's cool, but the science was what I it was rebuilt almost a hundred years before, and, uh, um, uh, and it's our job to continuously bring this information to them, so they will know that it was our most honorable, the Kibbe greatest Kibbe scientist right there. Kibbe 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 Kibbe. Kibbe. Yes, the greatest scientist Kibbe. Kibbe. who came up with and, and, and revealed the science for the, for, for the race, for human race and all, you know. So with that, uh, uh, I will end our, uh, our, our conclude our, my lecture of Kim and Amun. So in the next uh, uh, um, lecture, we're going to go with Isis and uh, uh, Asar and uh, the others. All right? Thank you for listening. Besalam, Yastra. Besalam, Yastra.